Okay, well, good afternoon, and thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Um, welcome to our webinar. I'm Dottie Head. I'm the Director of Communications for Georgia Audubon. And before I introduce Karina, I just wanted to make a few quick announcements. Um, we have a few upcoming events you all might be interested in. On Saturday, July 10th, we're doing a Wildlife Conservation Careers on Birds with Zoo Atlanta. This program is for high school and middle school students. Um, and you can register on our website. The program runs from 1 to 4.30. On Wednesday, July 21st, from 5 to 7 p.m., we're excited to do an in-person event um, after a year of webinars. It's going to be a birds and beers event at Monday night Brewing Garage on the West Side Beltline. We're going to gather together and have a few drinks and enjoy one another's company from 5 to 7 p.m. and then take a short walk about a quarter of a mile down the Beltline West Side Trail to see the new Chimney Swift Tower that we recently constructed there. And Adam Betchel is going to give us a short um, rundown on the work that George Audubon has been doing for Chimney Swift conservation. Our next monthly meeting is also going to be a webinar, and it's on Sunday, July 25th at 3.30. Um, it's going to be uh, Wayne Sintman with the Oceanic Society talking about plastic pollution and the albatross of the Midway Atoll and National Wildlife Refuge. It's going to be fascinating, um, so please plan to join us for that. That's also a free event. And Georgia Grows Native for Birds Month is coming in September. We'll also be having a fall native plant sale, and we will be putting out information on that in our August issue of Wing Bars, as well as in our Bird Buzz e-newsletter. So please keep your eye on those to learn um, when the plant sale dates are going to open up. We're trying to finalize that in the next week or so. Um, I will post links to all of these events I just mentioned in the chat box once we get started. Um, a reminder, this event is being closed captioned, and you can click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen to either enable or disable closed captioning if you'd like to use it or if you'd rather not. Um, we're going to hold the questions until the end of Karina's presentation, but if you have questions that you think about during the presentation, please put them in the Q&A box, and um, we'll do our best to get to them all at the end of the meeting. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Karina Newsom. Karina is the Community Engagement Manager at Georgia Audubon and a recent graduate of Georgia Southern University with a Master's of Science in Biology. Karina, who began in the field of wildlife conservation as a zookeeper, is an avian conservationist and connects people with birds across the state of Georgia. Having experienced the hurdles faced by Black, Indigenous, and peoples of color in wildlife conservation, Karina's mission is to center the perspectives and leadership of historically marginalized communities in wildlife conservation, environmental education, and the exploration of the natural world. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Karina to share her master's research with us. Thanks so much, Dottie. Um, and hello to everyone, all the Georgia Audubon members, folks who are tuning in today. It's so um, wonderful to be with you all, hopefully. Someday soon we'll be able to have these kinds of uh, <laughs> meetings in person. Very much looking forward to that. Um, but I'm really looking forward to sharing with you all the, the research that I've been working on for the past about two and a half years on a little bird called the seaside sparrow, which is found right here on Georgia's coast um, and definitely has my heart after spending some time working with them. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in. Right. So as it relates to the seaside sparrow, what I'm going to be talking about today um, is really the reality that they face um, as it relates to the threats of nest predation and the overarching threat of climate change, which is essentially a, a kind of ongoing multifaceted threat that exists for these birds, along with um, other species in the marsh. So when it comes to climate change, many people are familiar um, with the impacts of climate change, the ways that it uh, is currently affecting people and wildlife and some of the ways that it will in the future. Um, but just to run through a couple of the, um, the, the major impacts as it relates to the coast, the coasts are the most vulnerable areas of the world, um, not just in Georgia, not just in the United States, but across the globe. When it comes to climate change, the coasts are some of our most vulnerable locations, both for wildlife and for people, um, because a lot of these the issues that we face 
um, are multifaceted. As I said, it might be sea level rise that we're thinking about. It might be uh, adverse weather that we're thinking about. Um, so there are human and wildlife impacts when it comes to climate change. And not only are there both human and wildlife impacts, there are dangers on different scales, um, on small scales and large scales, particularly when it comes to sea level rise. Because coastlines are right adjacent to the ocean, they are exposed to a lot of the immediate threats of climate change that relates to issues such as increased storms and sea level rise. So coasts, not only are they the most vulnerable when it comes to climate change issues, they're some of the most cr crucial elements, crucial areas um, around the world, and it's definitely true in Georgia. Coasts are um, used by wildlife in particular, um, thinking about ecosystems such as salt marshes. Wildlife use these places during really vulnerable life stages across their natural history, um, particularly breeding, right? So um, the salt marsh, sorry, Dottie, would you mind? Oh, sorry, never mind. We got it. There we go. <laughs> There's a little background. Um, salt marshes are where a lot of wildlife spend a good portion of their lives when it comes to coastal creatures. Um, and so when it comes to Georgia salt marsh, I wanted to real quick, before we zero in on the seaside sparrow, introduce you all, um, and many of you are familiar probably with most if not all of these species, to who is found in Georgia's salt marshes on Georgia's coast. Um, so first and foremost, we have uh, reptiles such as the diamondback terrapin, which is a species of conservation concern. And um, diamondback terrapins will oftentimes lay their eggs right along the edge of or in the marsh. And so when those little ones hatch out, they are essentially using the marsh grass and the marsh mud to act essentially as a, protect, a protection against um, sources of mortality like predation, for example. And they start off pretty small. I actually found this, I happened to see this little terrapin as I was moving through the marsh. I almost didn't see it at all, about the size of a, um, a nice McDonald's uh, chocolate chip cookie, if you can imagine the size of that. Um, they start off pretty little living in the salt marsh. Now, I want to do a little quiz. I'm going to open up my chat so I can see what folks have to say. I want to see um, if, oops, hold on one second, Daddy. I see your message about the closed captioning. Um, I want to see if you all can recognize um, the nests that I'm showing you right now. So this is the first one. Um, so this is a nest that was along the edge of the marsh, actually right adjacent to the road, and it had three brownish speckled eggs. Does anyone have a guess as to what kind of bird made this egg? Any guesses? Throw it in the chat if you have a, if you have a, if you have a thought um, as to what species might have built this nest. And if you're feeling a little shy, that's okay. Um, this nest was created and these eggs were laid by a shorebird called the willet. There we go. Um, so this species is one that is one of the most boisterous and charismatic bird species on the coast. Um, it's hard to go uh, a day without hearing their beautiful, somewhat loud call. Um, they've got nice uh, kind of grayish body color, long wings as shorebirds tend to have that have both dark gray and white striping on them. Um, you have nests like this one that have lots of eggs. The bird that laid this egg, or excuse me, this these eggs in this nest um, can sometimes have up to 11 eggs in the nest. This is the nest of a bird called the clapper rail. Now, the clapper rail is much more secretive than the uh, typically loud willet when it comes to the coast. They tend to stay hidden in the marsh grasses, but also a very um, awesome, cool, and um, important species found on our coasts. And then this nest, which doesn't look much like a nest at all compared to some of the ones that we might be used to seeing, this is a nest that is pretty much entirely enclosed except for a tiny hole, which is not even visible in this picture, through which the bird will enter and exit. And this closed cup nest is actually the work of the marsh wren, which I will be talking about a little bit later um, in our, in our uh, conversation about the coast. They are much like any wren species, extremely spirited, we'll say. Um, very loud, um, very active, especially during the breeding season when their territoriality is really ramped up. And then finally, zeroing in on the species that I'll be speaking with you about today, the seaside sparrow. Um, and the seaside sparrow builds an open cup nest in the marsh grass 
And they build that nest, as is the case for the other nest that you saw as well, out of dead pieces of marsh grass. And they'll actually suspend their nest um, off of the ground, usually about 25 to 40-ish centimeters off of the mud. Um, when it comes to the natural history of the seaside sparrow, this species is endemic to tidal salt marshes. And that means that it is not found in any other kind of ecosystem outside of the salt marsh. And on the left-hand side, what you're seeing right now is a nice aerial shot of a stretch of marsh on Georgia's coast. And those lines that are cutting into the marsh are called tidal creeks. Um, so they're essentially little uh, inlets through which water coming from the ocean will fill up those creeks at high tide, and those creeks will empty out at low tide. But the seaside sparrows will actually build their nests and place them along the edge of these tidal creeks. Now the seaside sparrow, generally speaking, is a species of concern. There have been several subspecies, including the subspecies that I study, which is called the McGillivray's seaside sparrow, um, that have either currently have conservation concern issues or have had them. Um, in the case of the dusky seaside sparrow, which is unfortunately now extinct as of 1987, um, their habitat was essentially eliminated by um, human development in Florida in particular. And the last dusky seaside sparrow that was on record um, passed away after, um, I believe it was like a, a theme park that took up the, the last remaining habitat that this species was using. Um, the Cape Sable seaside sparrow, which is another species, another subspecies of the seaside sparrow that also resides in Florida, is currently listed as a federally endangered species for the same reason that the dusky seaside sparrow went extinct, and that is because of alteration of their habitat that is no longer usable um, for all the, the stages of their life history. Um, and so the, the, the seaside sparrow in general is a species that we're paying close attention to and that a lot of research is being dedicated to to figure out how we can protect this species going into the future. Um, and so as I said, the subspecies that I study is called the McGillivray seaside sparrow. And this subspecies is found on the coasts of South Carolina, Georgia, and Northern Florida. Um, we originally thought that this subspecies was also found in, into North Carolina, but genetic studies have revealed that this particular subspecies has a range that is a lot smaller than we originally thought that it was. So now it is only found in the three states that I mentioned. Um, and as I said, when I showed you the aerial picture of the salt marsh next to the seaside sparrow, they build their nests along the tidal creeks. This is a slightly more zoomed in image of the tidal creeks that are cutting into the salt marsh. And that little person there is me out there in the salt marsh. Um, and this is a more kind of clear image of what their nests look like on the left-hand side. That is a brand new, brand new hatchling um, that I think hatched that very day that is waiting for its sibling to hatch um, in the nest. Um, so the life stages of the seaside sparrow are what is typical for songbirds. So they start off at the egg stage. Um, they move to the hatchling and nestling stage before they can fly or find any food on their own. Um, then they'll spend uh, several uh, days as a uh, fledgling. So the, the period of time immediately after they leave the nest, they're still really unable to fly and are dependent heavily on their parents' um, resources when it comes to them finding food. Um, and then after a, a pretty much a long stretch of, of vulnerability, they are able to venture out on their own and oftentimes will stay in somewhat small flocks of juvenile seaside sparrows from multiple nests, hang out together, looking for food together and staving off predation. Um, now, when it comes to the threats to their survival, as is the case for birds in any ecosystem, there are many threats to survival. There are many things that have the potential to be a source of mortality. Um, but when it comes to the seaside sparrow and thinking about climate change, one of the biggest threats to the seaside sparrow is habitat loss from sea level rise. So this panel that you're seeing right here is uh, a series of images that are projecting how much habitat loss will occur because of the rising sea level. And so in the first panel, we have uh, in the green, the currently available uh, breeding habitat for seaside sparrows on Georgia's coast. So what you're seeing right now is strictly Georgia's coast and the green represents available breeding habitat for the seaside sparrow. As you move to uh, 2050, which is almost 25 years from now, and then to 2100, 
you can see how much that habitat decreases because of the encroachment of the sea. Um, because the sea is, the level is rising and it's getting further and further into the marsh, the available breeding space for this species is not only reducing, it's also fragmenting. So it's a bunch of little spots as opposed to one contiguous um, stretch of habitat availability, which poses a really um, kind of large scale habitat concern for the Megillivray seaside sparrow, along with all the seaside sparrows that are residing um, along the coast of the um, of Georgia, um, North and South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. Um, and in addition to having a large scale impact and threat to the seaside sparrow in the form of habitat loss and fragmentation, sea level rise, which is abbreviated here as SLR, um, also has more small scale, more immediate um, dangers when it comes particularly to those vulnerable life stages of the seaside sparrow. And that's particularly because it's um, going to increase the frequency of nest flooding. Um, so just really quickly, just as a, an emotional warning, this is kind of a, a sad, very much a sad video. Um, just to give you some context, nest flooding as a threat is not a new threat with climate change. Nest flooding has always been a threat that sea seaside sparrows have navigated, right? Sometimes high tides, which occur twice a day on the Atlantic coast, are higher than the parent birds expect, and sometimes those nests get flooded. Um, and so this is a threat they've had to deal with. But unfortunately, in the face of sea level rise from climate change, that threat is expected to increase in frequency because we've already seen that high tides are on average getting higher. So what you're going to see in this video is a video that I captured in the salt marsh in Georgia of a nest flooding event and it's kind of time lapsed a little bit. Um, and so we'll play this and I'll walk you through what's happening. So this is a mother seaside sparrow who's incubating her, her two chicks. And so what you see here is the water level rising in the chick's nest and they're floating on the top um, which is good, um, and in theory they could survive that, but unfortunately both chicks don't make it. And so the mother engages in a behavior called nest sanitation, where she takes the chicks that have passed away out of the nest so it doesn't cause any bacterial infections for the remaining chicks. She thinks that chick is still alive, and so she incubates it, but when she realizes that that chick has already passed away, um, she removes that one from the nest as well. And so that's what it looks like when a seaside sparrow nest experiences nest flooding and essentially what the, the parent, the, the female parent um, does in response. And so when it comes to the, the water, the threat of, of, of sea level rise, of increased nest flooding, that exists as one of the many threats that they face. The other threat that they face that I'm also going to be talking about and focusing on during this talk is the threat of predation, which regardless of what kind of ecosystem you live in, is a threat as a bird and as many types of animals that you will face on a regular basis, especially during the breeding season. Um, so as part of my research uh, in the salt marsh, there are certain elements, certain um, features of a habitat that we can expect to draw the attention of predators for a variety of different reasons. Um, in the salt marsh in particular, there are some features that are human made um, that have been shown through previous research to draw the attention of predators. And one of those is edge habitat created by roads. Um, and so if you know anything about roads, in particular the roads um, in uh, South Georgia salt marshes that usually are connecting the mainland, so for example Brunswick, Georgia, with the barrier islands where there tend to be a lot of people, there are a lot of food resources at those, at those locations. So when you have a city, right, like Brunswick, where there are restaurants and there are garbage dumpsters and there are um, all kinds of, of, of human resources that are essentially available to wildlife, that um, essentially increases the, the population of things like small mammalian predators, such as raccoons, for example. Uh, but in addition to essentially being a, uh, a hot spot for food resources, subsidized food resources for, um, for predators, especially mammalian predators, these wetlands also serve as corridors into, or excuse me, these, 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 uh, these roads serve as corridors into the wetlands. Um, and so small mammals naturally go into wetlands to look for food, but when you have essentially a clear path that leads straight into it, that makes the access to those wetlands a whole lot easier. Um, so when you combine the subsidized food resource, resources from the, the presence of restaurants and other food bearing uh, entities from humans, along with the ease of access into the marsh, you can think of roads as being a real hot spot for the presence of predators. And that's what I expected to be the case um, for the seaside sparrow. 
Um, now, there are also natural forms of edge habitat in the marsh, in particular, the edge of the marsh that is against the water, against the tidal river. Um, and so while this is definitely not a human made or human subsidized edge, um, there is an increased abundance of prey items along the edge of the tidal river as it cuts up against the marsh, particularly in the form of invertebrates, invertebrate prey, um, like ribbed mussel, for example, which I think people eat as well. Do you like those? I can't remember. I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a shellfish eater, but I, I think people eat mussels. Um, but raccoons also love to eat mussels. And so a lot of mussels will kind of essentially congregate on the edges of these marshes, which essentially is creating another hot spot, another restaurant, if you want to think of it that way, for predators, especially mammalian predators in the marsh. Um, now, thinking of these two threats, nest flooding and nest predation, um, the seaside sparrow is not only dealing with both of these threats happening at the same time, these threats are opposing one another. And I'll demonstrate to you what that means. Um, so this is just, I want to show you a picture of a seaside or a video of a seaside sparrow nest. Um, so seaside sparrows have to place their nest in such a way to avoid both of these threats, flooding and nest predation. And they have to do that by number one, building their nests off the ground and number two, being concealed enough that predators can't find them. So as you can see, or kind of not see at the beginning, it's really hard to even see the nest until you are right up on it, parted all the grass and come right upon the, the nest itself. Um, so when it comes to the way that they place their nest, the way they build their nests and um, the location of the nest, they have to both avoid um, detection from predators and flooding during the high tides. And as I mentioned, these threats are opposing. And what that means is, when a seaside sparrow places their nest in the grass, if they place it too low, too close to the ground, they risk increased nest flooding, right? The closer your nest is to the ground, the more likely it is that the high tide when it comes in will flood your nest. However, research has also shown that the higher a nest is off the ground, the more visible and detectable they are to predators. So that means essentially that there is a source of mortality coming from the bottom and coming from the top. So the seaside sparrow has to place their nest along this very, very fine balance of threats in order to raise a successful clutch of offspring. Um, now, thinking about nest flooding, right? Um, so as I said, they have been exposed to the threat of nest flooding for, for eons, for as long as they have been sparrows living in the salt marsh. And their behavioral adaptation to responding to nest flooding has also existed for a long time. If they experience nest flooding and their offspring die, their behavioral response is to build another nest immediately, right away, but they'll build it higher off the ground, typically on average about seven centimeters higher off the ground. But as we just saw, the higher a nest is off the ground, the more exposed to predators they become. And so when you think about the reality of sea level rise and the fact that sea level rise originating from climate change is expected to increase and currently is increasing the average height of high tides and expected to increase the frequency of flooding, what are seaside sparrows to do, right? Um, sea level rise is, is expected to essentially constrain um, the, uh, or excuse, excuse me, predation is expected to constrain the seaside sparrow's ability to respond to sea level rise, to respond to nest flooding, because if they're having to raise their nests more frequently, nest predation is right there waiting as another source of mortality. So they're essentially caught between a rock and a hard place as this one threat of sea level rise gets worse. So that's where my research comes in, at the intersection, um, particularly though on the side of nest predation, because when it comes to wildlife management and you know, what we can do for the seaside sparrow, there's not a whole lot that wildlife managers can necessarily do about sea level rise, as that is a very large scale problem that needs to be addressed on an equally large scale, right, by essentially all of the major polluting industries on the planet. That's a whole other conversation. Um, but we can do something about nest predation. So understanding the threat of nest predation can possibly help us to maybe relax that constraint that exists for the seaside sparrow as they navigate a future where nest flooding um, and higher high tides is the reality. Um, so the overarching question of my research is, can the relative threat of nest predation 
be predicted. So depending on where across their landscape they place their nests, can we, is there a pattern to where nest predation happens more frequently compared to other locations? Um, and that is the overarching question that I wanted to answer through my research. And so in order to understand the predictability of nest predation threat, or essentially the pattern, the spatial pattern of nest predation threat, I had to answer two questions within that overarching question. Um, and for this research, I did focus in specifically on mammalian nest predators, um, as they were expected to kind of be one of the more common predators for the seaside sparrow in the marsh. Um, so firstly, the first question is, does mammalian predator distribution vary in a predictable way along two habitat gradients, and in specifically the habitat gradients that I mentioned, um, roads and tidal rivers. So is there a predictable pattern to the, the threat of nest predation um, with distance to roads and distance to tidal rivers? The second question that I ask within this overarching question is, are nests that are located in areas of greater predator activity more likely to be depredated? Um, so my predictions around these questions was for number one, um, that yes, that predator distribution would vary predictably along those two gradients. And I expected that as you got closer to roads, you would see an increased um, uh, predator presence, again, because roads act as funnels into the marsh, and they're also connected to areas of high human activity where there is lots of human food available to increase their populations. Um, and that mammalian predator activity would increase closer to tidal rivers as well because there is that concentration of prey of particularly rib mussels and oysters and things like that. Um, as it relates to areas of greater predator activity and nest predation, um, it's kind of intuitive that I would expect that in areas where we're, we see more predator activity, that we would also see higher frequency of nest predation for the seaside sparrow. But I had to answer these questions in order to actually verify if these patterns were accurate, these expectations were accurate. Um, so the location of the research that I conducted was, as I said, on the coast of Georgia, but specifically in Glynn County in Brunswick, Georgia, and Jekyll Island, Georgia, in the marshes um, in those cities. And I did a, all of my data collection between the summers of 2019 and 2020. And just to kind of zoom out to give you an idea of where along Georgia's coast those salt marshes are located, I've got a nice um, little larger map of the state of Georgia so you can see that we are in the south, or excuse me, yes, southeast region uh, of the um, state of Georgia, the southern part of the coast. Um, so, um, in order to understand the first question, the, 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 the first element of um, uh, my overarching question, the distribution of predators, I had to have a way to monitor predator activity and, and be able to detect uh, how, how uh, dense predators were in some areas compared to, compared to others, particularly along the two gradients that I mentioned. And so to do that, I used camera traps placed across the marsh in, um, this is just one of my marsh sites, just to give you an idea. And all the yellow dots that you see are locations where I had camera traps. Um, and of course, when it comes to electronics in a, an aquatic and saltwater <laughs> environment, no less, you have to do a lot to marsh proof them to make sure that your very expensive equipment does not get destroyed um, by the salt water. And so I had marsh adapted um, cameras that were placed in these spaceship looking contraptions in such a way that when a predator walked by the camera, a picture would be taken uh, of those predators. And on each of the little PVC poles that you see here, there is a cotton ball that was dipped in sardine juice so that if a predator was walking by, they would smell it and get captured by the camera. Um, and just to let you know, all of the camera traps had the same amount of sardine juice on them, so there was no um, bias in the sampling. There weren't certain areas that had more or less than others, so it was equal across. Um, and so when it comes to understanding um, the second question of does nest predation vary with predator distribution, I of course had to find seaside sparrow nests. And so to find the nests, um, it's very difficult to detect them, firstly, because you're looking for a nest made of marsh grass, hidden and concealed in marsh grass. And so it's like looking for a specific piece of hay in a haystack. Um, it seemed very impossible at first, but thankfully the parents, uh, their behavior was very pronounced whenever you got close to a nest. And so I would be listening out for this sound that I'm gonna play for you right now. So that's a mother seaside sparrow chipping um, because I'm close to her nest and that allowed me to zero in on its location. 
Um, and then in order to record the, the fate of the, of the nests, I had video cameras placed on several of the nests that I found um, in order to capture the nest fate, which I also had another little piece of equipment to help me do, um, but also to capture the identity of the predator. So what species was actually responsible for this? Um, and so to find seaside sparrow nests, I would walk up and down the uh, tidal creeks in the salt marsh. As I mentioned, these tidal creeks are the locations where the seaside sparrows would place their nests. And each seaside sparrow pair would have essentially one nest per channel. Um, so in those really long stretches of channel, right, you walk up and down each one and there would only be one nest per channel. So it was a whole lot of work for um, what felt like not some, a whole lot of payoff uh, necessarily, but um, being out there in the marsh and, and, and doing all that walking and getting all muddy is what you have to do to study the seaside sparrow. And it definitely built character, um, but it was also a really cool experience as well. And so the video cameras essentially looked like this. Again, marsh proof equipment with a nice camera placed on top of the seaside sparrow nest. Um, and there was no increased rate of predation for nests that had cameras versus those that did not. Um, so I'm gonna have a couple of graphs in here. I'm not gonna get too technical or anything like that when it comes to the results, but I just wanted to kind of visually show you what our results looked like. Um, so when it co comes to the first question, understanding the pattern of predator distribution in the marsh, my predictions um, were, were matched. And I'm gonna show you a couple of the uh, mammals that we saw. So some of the mammals that we caught on our camera traps included species like the marsh rice rat, which is a rat species that's native to coastal Georgia that is actually adapted for life in a tidal environment. Um, the American mink, which is another uh, species of mammal that is, again, really well adapted for life um, near water. And then the raccoon, which is not necessarily specifically adapted to a salt water or tidal environment, but they can make it, they can make it work. Um, and my predictions, as I said, were followed. So as you um, got closer to the road, and as you got closer to the tidal river, um, predator occurrence, predator um, activity increased, um, number of detections increased. So on the y-axis, on the vertical axis, you have number of detections. On the horizontal axis, you have distance to road. So as that distance away from the road increased, so did the number of predator detections. Same for the tidal river. As you got further away from the river, the number of predator detections went down. As you got closer, the number of predator detections went up. Um, now, when it comes to nest predation, um, just to give you an idea of, of how many um, nest predation events each species was responsible for, and again, this is just on the subset of nests that had video cameras, um, the most common predator were the um, American mink when it comes to mammals, then we had raccoons, rice rats, and marsh wrens, which I'll get to in a second, and mummy chogs, which I'll also get to in just a second. Um, to show you a little bit of what nest predation looks like and what I would capture on my cameras, this is um, a seaside sparrow nest that has a single egg in it. Um, and what we're going to see now is one of our common predators, the American mink, come in, sniff around, and boop, take the egg. Um, so usually these instances of predation were fairly quick, <laughs> fairly quick encounters. Um, and uh, the American mink, as I said, is a, uh, a a semi-aquatic mammal, very good at swimming, very good at hunting aquatic predators. Um, they are found throughout pretty much all of the United States and they are pretty strict carnivores. So they are opportunistic feeders. They'll eat insects, fish, birds, um, everything in between, crabs. They will eat whatever they can get their little paws on. Um, and they're crepuscular, which means that they're most active during dawn and dusk. Um, and as I said, because of the way that they're built, they're really good at hunting aquatic prey. Now, another one of the predators that we saw was the marsh rice rat. They're much smaller, so they can climb up on the grass and into the nest. And I think this one will look back at us for a nice shot of its beautiful face. While I'm always rooting for the seaside sparrow, it is very cool to see some of these predators in action and see what these interspecies interactions look like in the salt marsh. Um, and she sits here and munches on these eggs for a little bit of time. And so the marsh rice rat is a species that is found often in grassy habitats, most often wetland habitats throughout the coast of the southeastern United States. Um, they are omnivores, so they'll eat both plant material and animal material. Um, and they're actually really good swimmers. There have been many documentations of these tiny rats, which their bodies are about this big. 
about three inches or so, and they will swim directly across a fast moving river without being swayed at all. They're very, very good at what they do, particularly when it comes to swimming. Now, I mentioned a mummy chog, okay? This was the most unexpected predator of the entire season. Another kind of warning, this is a little bit hard to watch. I definitely cried a little bit when I watched it, but I also have my jaw on the floor because I could not believe what I was seeing. So during a high tide nest flooding event one night, I was watching this video and all of a sudden a fish jumped into the nest. And I was like, what? I could not believe what I was seeing, right? And so my mouth was open for the entire time I was watching this video. Take a look. So in the in the nest, it's very blurry. These are like Dunkin' Donuts parking lot grade security cameras, okay? Um, but what you're seeing in the in the, the nest, there's a, a fish that's the dark kind of line in the bottom of the nest. There's a chick that's on top. It's like the bright white image along with two eggs that have not yet hatched. Take a look at this. The fish grabs the chick and starts depredating it, predating it, drags it underwater and is tearing it apart, tearing pieces of flesh off the chick to eat it. I could not believe my eyeballs, y'all. A fish preying on a bird in the nest. Who does that, right? Who's heard of that, right? And it's just incredible the things that we get to see as scientists with technology. Again, this isn't like Nat Geo gray technology by any stretch of the imagination, but when we're able to monitor everything that's happening at a nest, especially on the coast, we're able to witness all kinds of interspecies interactions that we had no idea was happening. Um, and so we, we, we recently actually published this finding in the Wilson Journal of Ornithology. Um, so you can feel free to check it out if you wanna learn more about what happened there. But I absolutely could not believe what I saw. Now to tell you a little bit about the mummy chog. Mummy chogs have been described as the world's toughest fish. Toughest fish. Um, you can think of them as the raccoons of the fish world. Um, these are also found along the coast of the eastern United States, and they tend to exist and, and live in large schools. Um, and the reason why they're so described as being so tough is because they can survive in tidal environments, which means that, you know, the water comes in and it goes out multiple times a day. So they're having changes in dissolved oxygen in the water. They're having changes to the salinity in the water, to the pH in the water. They're experiencing all these chemical changes multiple times a day and they thrive in these environments. Um, and they're also opportunistic feeders, right? And if that wasn't enough, the mummy chog has also gone to space. Astronauts sent mummy chogs, both uh, adult mummy chogs as well as unhatched eggs. And within a couple of days, they were completely adapted and completely comfortable essentially living in a weightless environment. And when the eggs hatched, um, the adults when they went to space, they were kind of swimming upside down and doing weird things for a couple of days and then they were fine. When the eggs hatched in outer space, they were immediately able to swim in a weightless environment with no issue. How unbelievable is that, right? Okay, okay. Um, now, just to be clear, right? So some people, you know, ask, well, wouldn't that chick have died anyway, you know, because it flooded? Chicks don't always die in a nest flooding event. They can survive. So this is another blurry video. But if the chicks can keep their heads above the water, they will survive. Um, and this is a video of a mother actually feeding her chicks during a nest flooding event during a high tide. And the chicks are old enough where um, they can actually keep their heads above the water. Um, and another thing to think about, of course, is if they are submerged for too long and they lose control of the, the, the temperature of their body, that can also cause them to, to pass away during a high tide event. Um, but they, they have been documented to survive them as well. So that instance of the fish was definitely a, a predation as a source of mortality. Now, one thing that I saw in this video, which, which you know, kind of confused me and baffled me. So you see the mom here kind of tapping the chicks and she's kind of on the edge of the nest, um, surveying what's going on. Um, the video cameras that I placed in the, in the marsh tended to cut out at the times of, of the greatest climax in the plot line. So what you're about to see here, this Eastside Sparrow mother has the chicks that are underwater, but for some reason, her instinct to incubate, I, I think it seems that she's kind of trying to decide what to do. And ultimately she actually decides to sit on top of the chicks during this high tide event. Um, and unfortunately, as a result of that, those chicks drowned. 
Um, and so there, it, it, the, the behaviors that you see as, as these creatures are, 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 are weathering a variety of, of threats to their survival is very interesting, some of these behaviors. Um, now, this is the second un unexpected predator encounter that we saw in the marsh, okay? Remember those wrens I told you about at the beginning? Take a look at this. Okay, so this is a seaside sparrow nest with an egg right there in the middle. Here comes a marsh wren. Watch what it does. The wren is poking holes in the egg of the seaside sparrow and taking a sip of the yolk, okay? So not only is it going in and killing the egg, it is also uh, engaging in a predation activity of actually eating the seaside sparrow as it's developing, okay? So not only does the marsh wren poke a hole in the egg to kill it, eat some of the yolk out of the egg, as you're seeing it do right now, taking several big gulps, it does this next. Okay, oh, some more pokes for good measure. All right, watch what it does. It picks the egg up and throws it out of the nest. Y'all, I could not believe, once again, I could not believe what I was seeing. Um, there had been many times in the marsh where I would find a nest that had eggs in it, and then, you know, the next time I checked on it, the eggs were simply just gone. Um, and I, you know, I, I was like, what, well, it doesn't seem like predation because there's no shell fragments. Usually if a mammal came and ate the egg, there would be pieces of shell all over the place. No shell fragments, the eggs are just gone or there'd be, um, yeah, essentially just an empty nest. And to see that marsh wrens were actually throwing the eggs out of the nest is one of the potential explanations for some of these empty nests that I was finding um, that didn't really make sense at the time. So if you're wondering why on earth would a marsh wren go out of its way to kill a seaside sparrow egg and throw it out of the nest, I'm glad you asked. As I mentioned before, wrens are extremely territorial birds, especially during the breeding season. Wrens across different species have been shown, have been seen to engage in infanticide, which means killing of hatched bird offspring of other birds, um, and egg destruction of other species of birds that are nesting within their territory, within the vicinity of their own nest. Um, in addition to that, they have been seen um, doing the same to other wren species of their own, or other wrens of their own species. So if you are a bird of any species, heterospecific or conspecific, same species or different species, and you're in their territory, that's a bad look. That's not gonna be, it's not gonna end well for you as a bird. Um, so this behavior has been documented in a lot of species of wrens, but it has not been documented yet for the marsh wren. Of course, given what we know about wrens, we are not shocked to see this. We, we even expected that they would act this way, that they would engage in this kind of territorial behavior, but it hasn't been documented yet. So this is really exciting and hopefully we'll be publishing this, um, this observation as well, along with the Mummy Chog publication. And um, the reason why this matters in the context of the seaside sparrow is because marsh wrens essentially share the same niche as the seaside sparrow. They nest in the Spartina tall marsh grass of Georgia's coastal marshes. They nest along the tidal creeks. They eat the same thing, insects, small crabs, other invertebrates. Um, and so there is a huge overlap, a almost complete overlap between the life history of the marsh wren and the life history of the seaside sparrow. And so um, when we think about this reality, we have to think about what this might mean for the future of the seaside sparrow. Um, so, okay, we, we covered the, the nest predator, the identity, identity of the predators, the pattern of pre, uh, pre predators across the marsh, the distribution of mammalian predators. Now, when it comes to the interaction or the relationship rather between where predators are seen most often and the frequency of nest predation, there was no relationship between those two, right? So initially I thought that, hey, in areas where we see more predators on our camera traps, we would expect to see an increased frequency of nest predation events for the seaside sparrow, but we didn't see that relationship, which is baffling, which was baffling at first. Um, and so thinking about all of these results that I just talked about, what does this mean? Um, so just to kind of wrap back around to paint the full picture, the, the occurrence, of mammalian predators across the salt marsh followed my predictions. As you got closer to roads, predator detections went up. As you got closer to tidal rivers, predator detections went up. Um, but 
there was not an increased frequency of nest predation for the seaside sparrow in the areas that had the most predators. Um, there was no relationship there. So I was trying to think, why might this be the case? There were a couple of things that came to my mind why I didn't see the relationship that I expected to see. The first one being that, hey, maybe the mammalian predators are not that important of a predator for the seaside sparrow. And it's actually maybe the marsh friends, right? Which I was not monitoring as far as their distribution that are contributing the most to nest predation events, to nest failure um, compared to mammalian predation events. And that's why I saw a disconnect between those two uh, variables. Um, the second thought that came to my mind was, well, maybe we're just, I'm not, I'm just not capturing the, 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 the fine scale movement of predators, right? So when I placed the camera traps in the marsh, I was very careful to place it away from the tidal creeks themselves because that's where the seaside sparrows place their nests. And so I didn't want to have a, a camera trap or a large object in those locations um, or that close to the tidal creek because I didn't want to influence nest predation. So I had it kind of between the tidal creeks to capture the movement of the marsh. But maybe there is more movement happening closer to the tidal creeks that I just didn't know about because I didn't have camera traps that close. And so maybe there was a disconnect for that reason between where predators actually are spending a lot of their time and where nest predation was happening. Or, 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 Maybe seaside sparrows were placing their nests with respect to where predators were and where they were not. Um, and it turned out this was actually the case. So I, when I ran an analysis to compare the physical location of seaside sparrow nests across their breeding habitat to the location of the predators, seaside sparrows were placing their nests in the areas that had the, the fewest predator detections. Um, so that's why uh, we, we, we believe that there was a disconnect between where predators were found most often and where nest predation was happening. Seaside sparrows are placing their nests um, away from areas that have high uh, frequency of predator activity. Um, and just again, to show you a little graph to, to illustrate this relationship, um, just take a look at the... Um, the graph on the right-hand side, as you uh, increase pred the predator occurrence, right, you decrease the probability of the nest presence. So on the y-axis, we have probability of nest presence that a, the seaside sparrow nest would be in a given location. And on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, you have uh, predator occurrence index, essentially a, a proxy for the abundance of predators in an area. And so as you increase predator occurrence, you decrease the probability of nest presence, which is exactly what I was describing just now. Um, so to wrap it all up, to wrap it all up, uh, to leave time for questions, um, why does this kind of information, answering these kinds of questions, matter in the, in the scope of seaside sparrow conservation, of coastal bird conservation? Um, number one, it's really important that we understand the, the, the details of the kinds of threats the seaside sparrows are facing during their breeding season. Um, and understanding predation in particular, um, particularly when it comes to the spatial pattern of predation and where it's happening most often compared to um, where it's not happening most often, um, might allow us to be able to target certain areas for preventing um, predators to access the breeding locations of seaside sparrows with more efficiency. If we know that predators are more concentrated in a certain area or near certain features in a salt marsh, for example, the roads, um, wildlife managers might be able to invest in predator management in those, in those locales, in those regions. Um, it also, this research along with previous research points to the impact of causeways because we saw such a strong relationship between where predators were and the roads especially, even more strongly than we did with the tidal, closeness to the tidal rivers. Um, secondly, other species may benefit from the management of predation because any species that lives in the salt marsh, not just a seaside sparrow, is going to be feeling the impacts of things like decreased marsh space and increased heights of high tide. And so if we can relax this one element, this one source of mortality, any species that is spending vulnerable life stages in the salt marsh would subsequently benefit from that kind of management. Um, thirdly, because we know and we can, we, we can project into the future what the impacts of climate change, specifically in the form of sea level rise, will mean for the coast, we can essentially plan, okay, what are we going to do once we get to 2050, 2075, 2100, when we have this increased frag, uh, fragmentation of habitat, reduced area of habitat, um, you know, 
we're not surprised when it comes. We know that it's coming and we can implement steps to protect seaside sparrows and other species on the coast with the information that we've gathered now um, so we can be prepared. And just to let you know, this sea level rise prediction, uh, projection, excuse me, is assuming a moderate prediction. Um, a, a moderate expectation. This isn't the most extreme, extreme sea level rise um, model. This is a, a very moderate and very likely one for Georgia's coast. Um, and then fourthly and finally, biodiversity, once lost, can't be replaced. And um, even species like the seaside sparrow, which someone who may not appreciate birds as much as the folks who are on this webinar do, um, and may look and say, hey, this is you know, another brown sparrow. There are, you know, a thousand and one brown sparrows around the world. Why invest the time to, or the resources to conserve this one? Um, it took millions and millions of years to create this specifically adapted bird, this bird that is adapted to life in a very extreme and dynamic environment like the tidal salt marsh. And so to preserve this species is not, you know, just, we're not just doing it because, wow, we, you know, we're sparrow fans or uh, we love birds, but it took a long time for that creature to come into existence in the way that it is. And they play a very important role in making our coasts healthy places um, for wildlife and for ourselves. And for that reason, we wanna make sure that we protect the biodiversity that's existing in our coastal salt marshes. Um, and so with that, I will go ahead and end. And I do wanna quickly just thank the team that made all this happen. Um, my, uh, my advisor, Dr. Elizabeth Hunter and all the people in the Hunter lab, um, as well as the various uh, generous donors to my research that include Georgia Southern University, where I graduated from the Georgia Ornithological Society, Institute for Coastal Plain Science and Sigma Xi. And so with that, I will stop and take any questions um, if folks have anything um, that you would like to know more about from what I've mentioned today. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Karina, that was fascinating. Thank you. Um, I have a question. How, how many eggs do they lay typically? How many eggs does a seaside square typically lay? Good question. So they, they'll lay up to around six. The average was like four or so, but I've, there, there were nests that only had one egg in it. Um, frequently. So there, there's a range up to about six. Um, does anybody have any questions? If you do, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we will have free to answer them. One thing I'll say, since there's a, a little bit of time here, um, if, again, if you have questions, please do throw them in. Um, one thing that I want to say is that I want to impress upon those of you who are listening, if any of you are, you know, participating in the conservation field as part of your career, or you're just a, a recreational birder, or anywhere on that spectrum, Wildlife conservation cannot happen in a vacuum without thinking about people, right? So, of course, this presentation was very specific to wildlife and the seaside sparrow more specifically, um, but any management that happens when it comes to wildlife conservation of birds or any other kind of species of animal, we have to think about how the, those management decisions also impact the people living in a place. And so one of the reasons why I really appreciate Georgia Audubon is because we do have a very intersectional approach to how we conserve, right? We're building places where both birds and people thrive, because whatever conservation we, we do participate in, support has to also benefit people or else it won't work and it's not just. And so I do wanna just throw that out there. Okay, I see a question. Um, yeah, you wanna go ahead. Well, Ann McCallum asked, I'll go ahead and relay them to you. Um, she says she's not seen one of these, which surprises me because um, Ann's such a phenomenal birder. Um, do you have any suggestions on where she should go look for them or should we just leave them alone? I've heard them more than I've seen them, but I have seen them a couple of times. Yes. So I would say that if you, so if you go to Brunswick, Georgia, there, there's a causeway that connects Brunswick to little, or excuse me, Brunswick to St. Simon's Island. It's called the Tourist Causeway. If you go on that causeway, there's a pull-off that allows you, it's where a lot of people who go fishing um, in that area will go. There's a pull-off right before the bridge crests over the water. If you take that pull-off, and you look really far out, you'll need like some, some good binoculars or a scope. But those creeks that I mentioned that you can't really see from the road, but they're gonna be standing usually on the tops of grasses, um, especially during the breeding season, the males will be up there singing. So if you can pull off on that section and, and pull out your binoculars and look far out into the marsh, from what I know, that's the best place to see them unless you have like a boat and can go boating out in the, in, into the, into the water, which most people don't have. So the Taurus Causeway is gonna be your, your best shot. I know we also saw him on both the shorebird trip with Adam to the Georgia coast, as well as on his trip to, um, to Merritt Island. So, so consider going on those trips because you know Adam can conjure birds and just put you on. Right. <laughs> he can materialize them somehow. He materializes them, <laughs> I don't know how he does it. It's a miracle. 
yeah. Um, um, I will say one of the, um, oh, go ahead, Dottie. No, you go ahead. I was going to say, one of my favorite things about doing this work was that working in the salt marsh, the marsh is not built for people to walk around in, y'all. Like, it, it takes all of you, all of oneself to, to just move around and walk in the salt marsh. But it was the phys physically the most difficult thing I've ever done in my entire life and probably ever will be. Um, but it was also like the most enchanting experience I've ever had. While I was specifically looking for seaside sparrows and, and studying them, I was able to witness like all kinds of activity out there. I was constantly distracted by little fiddler crabs and stone crabs and periwinkle snails and roseate spoonbills and you know, everything in between. There's so much life happening. Um, and I didn't want to say there was one day where I was out in the salt marsh and I was having a hard day. It was really hot. There was like, it felt like there was no oxygen in the air. And I sat down. I was honestly crying a little bit because I was so tired. And I had my feet in the water. I was sitting on the edge of the marsh. And I, I, I felt a little hopeless at that time because I was struggling to find any nests. And all of a sudden, a shark swam over my foot. Y'all, I can't make this up. That might sound scary, but it's exactly what I needed in that moment. I started weeping. I couldn't believe it. And then literally in that same situation, dolphins, like a pod of dolphins started swimming and jumping out of the water just in front of me. And it was like the marsh, it, it puts you through some of the, the hardest physical labor, but it also gives you the, the greatest gifts of like being able to see some of the intricacies and details and just incredible like experiences when it comes to the wide diversity of wildlife that exists out there. So if you've not had the chance to visit Georgia's coast, we have to go, you have to go. Well, if we don't have any more questions, we will go ahead and wrap, oh, wait, hold on, wrap it. No, Queen is just thank you, or Esther's just saying thanks for joining us. But um, yeah, we really wanted an opportunity. Karina presented the, her master's research um, I guess you defended your thesis back in the spring, and um, we we were eager to hear about it. Not all of us were able to join for her thesis defense, so um, it's a great opportunity to uh, to hear about her work. Um, Thanks so much for and her as always. We appreciate we appreciate Karina and all of the talents and skills she has brought to George Audubon. So um, we look forward to seeing you guys. Thanks everybody for coming, and hope we'll see you either at the Monday Night Garage event or perhaps at um, perhaps at the um, at our monthly meeting next on the fourth weekend in July with Wayne Sentman on the plastic pollution with the birds of the Midway Atoll. So anyway, thanks everybody and you all enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thanks Sue. Thanks Esther. Thanks y'all.